Welcome everyone. Um, it's with great pleasure that I invite Dr. Annapurna Mamidipudi to give the colloquium talk this afternoon. Um, her talk is titled Telling Color by Smell, Memory and Song, the Innovation of Traditional Craft in South India. She's presently a researcher at Deutsche Museum Munich, uh, but she spends a lot of time here usually. Uh, she's co-founded Handloom Futures Trust in, based in Hyderabad two years ago, along with a few of her colleagues. She has had an extensive interest in both act, the activist side of Handloom as well as the epistemic side of Handloom and trying to be uh, creative across domains as well. Uh, she has tried to work with concepts of cognition that you see in music, in Carnatic music, and that you see in craft work. Um, her present research is titled uh, Weaving as a Technical Mode of Existence. Uh, which, about which she may share some thoughts at some point, I hope. Uh, with that, I invite her to do the talk. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, as uh, Chandan very kindly already told you, I've been working as an activist for a very long time and then moved to academia about 10 years ago. So, I have about 20 years of experience working in an NGO before I started working uh, uh, in a more uh, research environment. So, I will be talking a little bit about the last 10 years of work, but it draws very much on the previous 20 years of experience. So, I am not talking so much as an activist, I, I am talking more as a person who is thinking about it a little more analytically, which is not to say that we don't think about it analytically, but there's a certain immediacy to activist work that doesn't allow you to maybe read, for example. <laughs> we write a lot. We have to write reports. We have to write uh, uh, blurbs. We have to write recruiting <laughs> statements, but you don't get a chance to read. So, except policy documents, which are not the best kind of reading. So, I think this is this is one of the uh, differences. You sit and reflect and think and you have time to actually mull over things before you have to jump into action. I have to admit that it has slowed me down considerably, but I think it's for the good. <laughs> okay. So, so I started this journey in 2010 from activism to uh, academia at a point when the, the previous census had just come out. And we had lost about 30% uh, of the jobs in the previous 10 years. And uh, this was uh, 10 years when we thought we'd been doing well. The markets had opened up. We, all these, you know, social enterprise, livelihoods programs were doing quite well. Of course, by the end of that time, slowly you were also seeing the decline, for example, in microfinance and things like that, showing the signs of, uh, you know, wear and tear. But, you know, generally we'd been doing well in the markets. But the economic downturn completely crashed the markets, the handloom markets, the social markets, the markets that were willing to actually not so much buy because those markets were still there, but the markets that were willing to invest in handloom. For example, the patient capital that we needed, considering that the labor costs were much higher. So those kinds of sources of uh, capital completely dried up. And when we were trying to raise money from new sources, like from mainstream organizations. We said, look, we sh we've shown you that these are sustainable models. We've shown you that Handloom can make money. You know, it can actually pay for itself. You know, why don't you invest? And uh, we couldn't really convince people. So it was almost like uh, if they are going down, let's give them a good kick and send them on their way. You know, rather than, okay, this is a bad time. Let's try and see if we can, you know, help them through it and then they will, there's this tremendous fear that they will turn into this burden and this kind of um, millstone round our neck if we begin to help them. There's no end to this. Now that's a very different picture for the people who are actually working in handloom. If you're working with craft and handloom, what you see is the robustness, you see the creativity, you see the people, you see the enthusiasm and that's a very different picture. But it's not something that you can explain easily. And when, when you try and push for a more positive picture, because there's a very, very gloom and doom picture generally, 
Um, that seems to recruit sympathy, but that doesn't do much for the morale. Uh, then the kind of questions you get asked is, you know, aren't you just being romantic? You know, is it just sentimentality? Or is it regressive culture or some kind of elitism? You know, what is it that makes you think that craft should actually be supported? But I think at the core, what we all came to, we all agree on, I think, is that, that you need to affirm. If you want craft and craft livelihoods to survive, then you have to affirm them. You have to be in a position where you say, this, this is knowledge that is relevant. And um, also recognize that both the discourse of modernity and of tradition are profoundly disempowering. Because if you talk about modernity, you're talking about productivity, mechanization, and in that handloom weaving will not compete. And if you talk about tradition, then you're talking today in terms of museumization, and that too makes handloom futures extinct. So both these discourses, in between those two, the handloom weaver is really stuck. So I was looking for a kind of a way to talk about handloom knowledge that didn't jump into either this or that. And I was moving from this space where I had been in, within the theoretical framework of development, and which is a, also a very, very unequal kind of experiment, because you are always at, on, on the top. Even when you are representing the weavers, still the, that hierarchy doesn't change. And even though you try to be reflexive and you're trying to talk about symmetry and you say, let's take them into consideration and you, you do it and you learn all that, uh, all those methods, participatory methods, in the end, the basic hierarchy, the difference in position and power really doesn't change much. So I was already coming from that kind of anxiety that I don't want to now bring in a new set of hierarchies into this uh, discourse. But I think what kind of impelled me to talk about theorizing craft as knowledge and not just leave it in the livelihood labor uh, kind of space, which was what we were working with previously, is that we want to think of weavers owning not just their labor, but to own handloom also as their knowledge. So the minute you talk only of labor, then it's, it, it becomes something that can be replaced by a cheaper uh, machine or or even someone who's willing to do it cheaper so uh, so one one goal was okay how can it be owned as knowledge and and the other thing is that let for those who are in handloom we clearly see it as knowledge who, who look at craft you clearly see whether it's uh, arch traditional architecture medicine handloom I mean, it's very very complex knowledge but the only place where it's evaluated is in the market. We don't have other modes of evaluation. We don't have institutions. We, okay, you might have the government that gives out a master weaver a prize once in a way, but that's really not sufficient to talk about a mode of evaluation other than market. Now, imagine if our educational institutions were only evaluated by the market, what would happen? Considering that, I think that you know, Handloom has done really well in not completely going with the market, but staying with their strengths. And so then the question becomes not so much how do we save Handloom, but how has Handloom saved itself? Now, I didn't go into development or uh, post-colonial theory, or I, I didn't go into those frameworks. I went into this framework that's called Science, Technology and Society Studies which is basically looking, helped me because I trained as an engineer, it helped me to look at uh, the technical part of handloom and talk in terms of innovation, which is what I felt comfortable with. This very nuanced uh, uh, sociological analysis was beyond me, also because I had not learned to write like that. I, at the point I started writing, I could do bullet points. <laughs> so, uh, PowerPoint, but not, uh, you know, you know, so this, this framework seemed something that was suitable. But the questions that came from there was, you know, they were studying nanotechnology, biotechnology, emerging technology, risk societies, you know, uh, what science and technology can or cannot do for uh, humankind. And their question was, you know, 
why do we need to talk about craft labor when we have science and technology? Let's, you know, focus on that. Why are you even looking at craft? And from the other side, which is, this is a question that I incredibly difficult, but it seems like a very logical question to most people. They say, oh, why can't craft just be craft? Why do you have to valorize it as technology or as knowledge? Why can't we just enjoy it as just craft? And I still become the, the old, uh, uh, paralyzed with anger, not able to speak person when I hear this <laughs> question because it devalues what craft is uh, to my mind and it lacks, shows a lack of understanding of, of what these terminologies do when they travel back to craftspeople and it shows such a lack of that sensitivity, it still makes me quite uh, angry. So instead I would, I thought, okay, can we instead think about, but what does it mean to know craft? Okay, like if, you, if we're talking about craft as knowledge, can we say, okay, fine, whatever it is, you call it craft, you call it technology, you call it science, you call it culture, but what does it mean to know it? So from that lesser angry place, I was able to, uh, and now the question came from the crafts people in the opposite direction. So they say, well, why do we need theory? We have practice. Why do we need you to come and tell us, you know, all these theories? We, you give us market. You help us with market. That's enough. You know, this is not going to feed our stomach. You're thinking about my brain. I don't need you to think about my brain. Think about my stomach. So that's a very immediate kind of question that comes to you. But I think that once they begin, once you begin to have the conversation and they see that, if you want to own knowledge or own it, not as labor but as knowledge, then you know this makes sense. So, uh, quite a few. I had quite a few co-travelers with me who came along this journey. So these are the two. Uh, this is the question: How can we theorize traditional craft that is embodied and tacit rather than explicated, uh, like science, as knowledge? So I do this by describing actors' knowledge as innovation of tradition and also by exploring the politics of conceptualizing such craft work as knowledge. So these are the two things that I'm try I try to do. So, so I have a question for you. So when, you, when I say hand loom, uh, what immediately comes to mind? The loom? Okay, the loom. How many of you have seen a hand loom? Ah, I'm speaking to the converted. <laughs> but, but what comes to mind? Just to know where you are. This is not an exam. I just want to know where everybody is. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon after lunch. <laughs> I can't be the only one working. <laughs> what comes to mind? Huh? Excellent. Kanchipuram silk saris. And? Huh? Khadi, okay. Huh? The weaver. The weaver. The weaver. <laughs> the weaver? <laughs> wrong. <laughs> that is the wrong answer. And this when you say handloom. Intricacy, okay. The sound of the loom. Sound of the loom. Hard work, okay. Okay, if you think of people, when, you, when I say hand loom, and you, what is the picture that comes into your mind? Don't think of the word, think of a picture that comes into your mind, maybe of a person or, what comes to your mind when I say hand loom? What is the picture that comes into your mind? An old man wearing a white vest. Okay. Really? <laughs> no, that was not my picture, but I see that it could be a picture. Any other? That's an elite product. Elite product. Okay. Fine. And that's already a contradiction because an old man <laughs> wearing a vest. Do not people like me come very strongly in your visual, wearing handloom sarees and big bottu and walking around? <laughs> huh? Yes, yes. So we own handloom much more than 
the weaver. Do we know the name of any weavers? You, you probably know the icons of uh, handloom, right? Do you know any icons of handloom? Who are the icons of handloom? Kamala Devi, okay. This is a well-read uh, audience. But otherwise, Instagram, anybody wa wa follows handloom on Instagram? Ayyo. <laughs> Desi. NGO. Okay. Okay. Today, the big presence, Fab India. Fab India. Thank you. Huh? Rangasutra. Rangasutra. Okay. Okay. So, you are basically coming from a strong development background, which is fine. <laughs> the right names are. But, but there is also this kind of. Uh, so the NGOs own it, or the women who run the NGOs own it, or uh, the shops that sell handloom own it. When you talk about the actual people who make it, there's a generic weaver, right? So this is, and this is not a problem that is only rooted in our um, ignorance of, or our distance from the weaver. It's also rooted in the fact that it's very difficult to to explain or know or differentiate between the different kinds of weavers because what we see is a loom and a person working on it and that's the weaver. So what I'm trying, going to try and do having taken such a long time in, in, um, in introduction is quickly go through some examples that might make it a little more real. So telling color by smell, memory and song. So knowledge is tacit. Now this is a, uh, I don't know if you've heard of tacit knowledge. Anybody has heard of a framework called tacit knowledge? No, you have. Okay, basically the idea that not all, it can, not all knowledge can be explicate. That there are certain kinds of knowledge that are difficult to explicate and craft comes very much in that kind of knowledge. And uh, the picture you're seeing is that of an indigo vat. This is, uh, a vat, uh, fermentation vat that used to be used extensively in South India and the last practitioner, Yallappa, died about three years ago. And he had stopped dying between 70s and uh, 2000. Between, so the last time he had the regular vat going were in the 70s. He had 200 pots. By 2000, indigo dyeing had completely vanished. But he was a master who had been doing, who was fourth generation dyer already. So when we found him and asked him to restart the vat, he had absolutely no problem in uh, reconstructing and uh, starting the vats and teaching people. Now he has taught, he taught three people out of whom one has become a master. So after 15 years, you have again one master and supporting that one master is also too heavy for us because people don't understand what does it mean. Why should you pay 1500 rupees a kg for indigo? then you can get it for 50 rupees a kg. So this is the kind of thing. So generally knowledge tends to be tacit. And why is it that we don't know its value? Why don't we know it as knowledge? It's, there are three kinds of uh, tacit knowledges. One is somatic, second is collective, and the third is relation. This is a theoretical framework. Indigo has all three kinds of tacit knowledge. Yalapa used to tell color by smell. The first, you have to, when you go into the indigo vat, you cannot escape the smell. But the point is that the smell is actually an indicator. So it, it's not one smell. It's a range of smells that goes from a sharp, very sharp smell to a very rotten smell. And somewhere in between is the perfect color. And this is what you have to learn. And if you see indigo dyers when they are learning, it's, you know that it's, the color is taking hold of their brain when they are dyeing it and they come out and they sit and they are smelling their hands. It looks very <laughs> uncouth. <laughs> but if you are an indig if you're learning, then the thing you really have to imprint is that smell. So what do you have to learn? So it's, now how do you explicate that knowledge? It's, it's something that's in the body, right? So it's tacit because it's somatic. Now, so that's the indigo vat. Now, 
it's also collective. Now you can think of indigo knowledge as being only the knowledge that uh, you know the person who's making it knows. But when we had to revive it, actually Uzrama, the person that I worked with since uh, at, at that time, 1990 and 2000, when we revived the indigo vat, she would talk about this beautiful blue. None of us who was working with her had ever seen it. But the way she talked about it, it, it felt like it was, we had seen it and we desperately wanted it. So when she set us out and said, go find this old man, somewhere he's there. And we used to go looking. The memory actually was not even ours. It was a kind of a collective memory that was formed around it. And the knowledge is also collective. So one person knows the Chandrakali because their grandmother wore it. Somebody knows the Chandrakali sari because they used to make it. Somebody knows it because they wove it. Somebody knows it because they saw it in the museum. So it's between all these things that the Chandrakali sari exists. So knowledge is collective. And this is where I was able to make what was for me an important shift to think of the hand loom, think of hand loom, not just this, the loom or the weaver, but to think of it as a socio-technical system. So move from the isolated weaver, which is how we had started, to all the different actors, including the NGO, including the activist, and now even including the researcher, and all their different technologies. And I won't go too much into this, but this framework lets us see how then technology is also distributed. And it, so for example, if you take yarn, just something like yarn, across all the groups, they all have knowledge about yarn, but it translates to very different things. So to one, it's color matching, to another one, it's a comprehension of design, for another one, it's density of weave, for the other, it's color because the yarn plays different roles in their technology. So all of them have to know about yarn. It's not just the spinner who needs to know, but it has to be coordinated. So finally, I come to this, the case of Jamdani, which is the uh, kind of the innovation case. Now, I went to a Dutch university to do my PhD. I didn't have a master, basically, and I didn't have the patience to sit in a classroom. I was already 40. And there was no way I was going to put myself, I could not, I was not able to. So I went to this, uh, to Netherlands where they don't uh, ask you to sit in a classroom. <laughs> it's a very nice system. You have regular workshops, two and a half days, three day workshops, where, which are very intensive, which you work with 20 other PhD students and you take your data and your uh, empirical material forward. So by the end of it, you've you've talked to 20 people and then you're in regular contact with your guru, with your supervisor. You have one-to-one -one sessions with your teacher and he, poor man, has to give you a coffee and listen to all your ramblings. He has no option. <laughs> Luckily, the session ends in one hour like a therapist. <laughs> so if you haven't used it well, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> so uh, I started uh, working with him. Now what happened is that I was trying to make a case that there is innovation. And I had this other supervisor who, also, who was uh, more, a little more uh, hard on me because he knew a little bit more about uh, development. And what he said is that if really weavers are innovator, innovators, don't tell me about the past. Don't tell me how they have survived in the past. Go and show me what is the problem they're facing now. So he said, is there a problem they're facing now? I said, yes. At that point of time, yarn prices were fluctuating. He said, then tell me how they've innovated their way out of that problem. You go and see it. So that became a little difficult. Now, what if they didn't innovate? What if they were dying? But anyway, so I went and this was what I found is that it was a very interesting case. The cotton yarn prices had gone up. Now when prices go up, what happens to the price of the product is the labor cost gets squeezed. Now what you would expect generally and that happened is that these weavers then work more. So they increase their productivity so their wage component is made up. So they are actually running against the machines. But in some places, what I found is that some of them actually instead of speeding up, slowed down. They picked up a slower technology called Jamdani which is to insert threads and make extra patterns in the fabric. So, and it makes sense because you have to anyway pay that much for your yarn. 
might as well put more labor into it right and you get better value now this seems like a very counterintuitive uh, but how did it happen so within something like 3 years they went from 500 to 10000 weavers weaving this kind of jamdani and the way they could do it is because they did all kinds of innovations uh, so this is the product from 1850 the original jamdani and this is the kind of intermediate product that they were making which is not as pretty to my eyes but it had a huge market because it was all over pattern and very glitzy and people loved it and the way they so that was a product innovation definitely from the old product which was quite plain it was a market innovation because what they did was they took the sari to they were using telephones mobiles to reach what they called aunties and ladies in the city so these were opinion makers from their villages who had moved to the suburbs who would uh, uh, you know invite them home and uh, look at the sarees and they had their phone numbers so they could call them now an auntie is somebody who would call other ladies a lady is somebody who will buy one saree she can't afford to buy 10 sarees and sell on sell now if you sell directly to the lady you get more money but if you sell to the auntie you sell more sarees so you have to have a balance of aunties and ladies to uh, to do a good job of selling your sarees so they used the mobile phone so th what had happened was that socio technical ensemble picture that i showed you the new technology that had entered was the mobile phone so if you now you might say but but the mobile phone is not a hand is not hand loom it's it's another technology so then i went looking for a process innovation what was happening on the loom itself that was different now if you look closely can you see that this looks pixelated it looks like a bad resolution picture can you see that that's actually on the sari it's not just on the slide and that happens because they use they were using computer uh, programs to make the patterns so i sat with the computer programmer and said why are you doing that it's not as pretty as that don't do it you're using bad software or you're cheating the weaver so don't do that make it smooth and this chap kept telling me but it's not me it's the weaver and i said it's not the weaver because whatever you make is what he's making so you you do it right he'll do it right because i was still going with the hierarchy of the computer being over the loom but actually what was happening and i saw it in the interaction between the master the person who was making the on the loom and the programmer so he would come and he would say mm, i want a mango with two leaves then he will open a whole folder then he will say 100 turns and four bends so basically what he is saying is what is the resolution that he wants of the picture where it still looks pretty but is 100 turns and four bends is the amount of labor that goes into the thing so if you make it one to one if you make one thread to one thread uh, you you have to put you have to turn it every time so it's much more labor but if you every four threads if you make a shift you get a pixelation but it takes your labor down by four by four times sometime when you're sitting here a jamdani loom you will understand it better but basically it's a way of using the computer to to give you a pattern that looks nice enough that you can weave on the loom now for the person who's buying it there are people who don't care too much about that pixelation and the saree is cheaper so they don't mind buying it so the market for this product really shot up because the computer had come in so actually what had happened in the process was these are all the different processes that have to happen in order that jamdani is made you have to make the design you have to make the graph you have to set it up on the loom you have to do layout wages price you have to actually weave it and you have to change it to the next design this is the cycle now these are the old ways of doing it where the master weaver had to do all this stuff now in the computer jala or the pattern all the functions that are read the computer had speeded up only the weaving itself had slowed down so what happened was that in that circle some of the functions had speeded up so that the weaving could slow down so there was an optimization rather than a competition 
and that is how they were able to actually survive that yarn price. Um, but having done that, they recast it as tradition. So this is innovation, it's a new product. But having done that, they made up a whole story. They said uh, uh, there is a Bobbili princess and she used to wear this sari. And uh, this is uh, age old tradition. So this is not new. And indeed if you see it's difficult because that was the original product, then that is the interim product, that is, uh, this is the 1850s product, this is the interim product, now again they are making, able to make this. This is a kind of a jumpy, there is no clear trajectory of either improvement or efficiency, you know, it's, it's all very jumbled up. So what they do is, they, the, the work is like that and then what they do at the end of it is they say, oh this is tradition, this is not innovation. So you don't see the innovation actually because at the end of it they are recasting it as tradition. Now this is where I had a bit of a problem in my, with my supervisors because I went back and I said, I have found innovation. Uh, and I was using Sean Peter's model of product process and uh, market innovation and I said in all those three ways, uh, you know, handloom weavers are innovating. So then my supervisor sat me down and uh, the kindly gentleman who had sent me to go and look for the innovation, he said, you know, he, we were sitting in a train station and so sitting across each other and there was an empty chair and he said, you know, this is great. I have made a fantastic scholar out of you. But he said, if there was an Indian colleague sitting there, he would tell me, you have made a Dutch scholar out of her, where is the Indian? <laughs> so, then I thought, but I have done what you wanted me to do, I have shown you innovation, now <laughs> what do I do? How do I become Indian now? And while I was reeling with that stress, I had a, another experience from the opposite side. So, I was sitting in the home of this uh, very senior musician, uh, who um, did something very new on stage when she was performing and then said, just in case you think that this is a, some newfangled innovation, it's not, it's, it's tradition, it's what my guru used to do. So I was very excited, I went to her house in the evening and I said, see, this is what my weavers do, this is what you are also doing, you are actually innovating, <laughs> but you are calling it tradition. She got very angry. She almost threw me out of the house and even now when she sees me 10 years after the event, she will say, don't say that word, don't. So for her that innovation is very immodest because there is an I in it. It's not that she's a very modest person, she is very proud of her creative capability. But somewhere calling it new and yours gives it a kind of a immodesty that she, she didn't, it didn't fit her way of thinking. And this is exactly what the weavers were also saying, that talking about innovation is not really expressing what we do. So then I spent time with the musicians and tried to use their vocabulary to talk about this. And what I found is that they had a way of talking about it which was, you do sadhana which is repetitive practice and you do manodharma which is creative expression. So how many of you know these words? Okay. So sadhana is when you do and the, you have to sit there on stage and you have to produce this extempore music and that's manodharma. And then what is interesting is that the way in which they went through those steps, first you have to build skill through repetition, sing the same thing over and over and over. Then you have to learn rules through imitation. So if you have to learn the ragam kalyani for example, how do you learn it? You can't, somebody can't tell you the rule. You have to hear it and you have to sing it. So you have to imitate your teacher. Then you start varying small changes to learn the boundaries and you become fluent. And finally in the moment of performance, there is some uncertainty. You don't, you have to suddenly push beyond what you know. And that moment when you suddenly produce that, this, all these musicians who were, you know, quite uh, senior, they all called it the divine bliss of creativity. That was the moment that actually is a grace of God because it was not there before and it's there now. So it can't be me. If it was me, I would know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. It came to me. So it must be God. 
and it's so it's a divine uh, grace that's how they explained that and but they also said it requires a guru to show you the way now the younger musicians are less want to say god and things like that but they also say that it is something sublime and they all talk about a guru or a teacher who has to show you how not to fall into the wrong place because you have to take a leap of faith and you have to land right so the teacher is the person who guides you there and that moment of creativity is experiences the absence of self so you really don't uh, feel the self there and interestingly in cognition you have the exact same steps you have 10 years of practice importance of learning rules learning fluency through flexibility and testing for creative uh, ability happens with problem solving and there is a moment of eureka moment a moment when suddenly you, something comes to you you have a breakthrough and it's seen as a leap of insight rather than a leap of faith there and there to the supervision of the teacher if you all are doing your phd or ma thesis you know how important that guru is even here and uh, there to the moment of creativity is experienced as as an unconscious moment the flow he calls it the flow so what you can then see is when you look at it in terms of craft not so much as theory but you look at it as the actual craft of what are you doing when you take that approach what you see that in music and science in both you are building the craft through practice and innovation is always it's not something that comes rationally it's a kind of an unconscious surprise moment and acquiring craft through those things that i had said no repetition imitation and variation which are seen normally as lower forms of creativity so if you are repeating it's not creative if you are imitating it's not creative you are only making variations not creative to be truly innovative you have to do something completely new but that is the fourth stage you you learn it through these stages so if you think you can have that without having these it's not going to happen so then the question becomes not can you have craft when it doesn't innovate but actually the question is can you have innovation if you don't have craft whatever that craft is whether you call it science whether you call it because you are calling craft something which is engaged making doing whatever so what this does then when i carry it back to weavers when i when we are in discussion is that they are strategic enough to see that it allows them an opportunity for political action so they say yes so the word that for example uh, they came up with is a navakalpana a new imagination they don't call it innovation so they say yes we are capable of navakalpana we 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 won't call it scientific innovation but we will call it navakalpana so this this vocabulary becomes very important to connect and um, so there they say then you can say not modernization or mechanization which were the older traps but innovation of tradition that is not predetermined it's not that you have to go this way or that way or there's a, you know have to go faster and this is the better machine no you you can find your way you can go backwards also if you like and it's still an innovation and it's not manual labor that can be replaced by machine so the repetitive work the imitative work these are not if you replace them at this at that stage with machines you are never going to get to innovation so when you for example writing out your copy as we used to maybe people don't anymore uh, or when you are uh, learning your tables or doing repetitive work you are not thinking a machine can do this you are thinking unless i do this or you are writing until you develop fluency you do repetitive work right so that's the same and it is creative in innovation that engages both body and mind it's not something that only you're doing it's engaging your mind and that allows for a more promising future for handloom weaving and increasingly which is why i am sitting in munich as we go into this algorithmic world as we go into this world where we are handing over our decision making to machines which are not embodied which are not engaged with material which go very much on the basis of notations and coding words basically then you it offers actually this way of thinking about knowledge where embodied knowledge complex material knowledge actually is the basis for complex innovation that allows if you leave that out you're going to end up with a very simple world of black and whites 
because that complexity is not available in that notation that we have in the material and social world. So even SNT, science and technology, needs this kind of theorizing. Now, I'm going to stop, but with a small um, kind of a story of what this did for me uh, to, to theorize. So when, between 1990 and 2000, I had worked uh, extensively with, um, in the reviving of natural dyes. So that was when the chemical dyes had been banned by Germany for being toxic. So huge uh, fall in export. So the weavers were really suffering. So my boss said, go learn how to do natural dyes. That was something India was very good at. And you learn it and you teach. And because I was 21 years old and I was an engineer and I thought you could learn things from books, I picked up a recipe book from, you know, which had been written in the... Uh, you know, you know, by the bo botanists and the scholars, the, the, the um, British scholars during the colonial period, we used those recipes to again revive natural dyes. And the story that I always told was that I went with my book and the weaver came with his practical knowledge and we combined the two together and we produced this new technology. This is how I always thought of that, that I produced the textual knowledge, he produced the doing. I knew he did and together we made this new technology. But what helped me is actually thinking about all these things, thinking about the fact that knowing is not only from text, there are different kinds of knowing. What that did is, I went back and looked at 10 years of field notes and what I found was that actually, and then also did the reading. Now in Europe what had happened was that in the 17th century already they had moved to the language of chemistry. So they were already saying alkali, basic, so all the minerals around the dye, dye material they were referring to in their chemical form. Here they were still saying uh, karakai, uh, patika, but there they were saying uh, you know aluminum sulphate, uh, tannin, so they had already shifted to the chemical thing. Now, 100 years, they never got fast colors. They struggled with getting the fast colors because the interaction between these minerals, which were the, what we call the mordants, which was actually what fixed the color to the cotton. Those had been replaced by these chemicals. They were so convinced that the chemical is a better replacement that they, didn't, they th kept thinking they are doing something wrong. And they kept struggling. But they went on for a hundred years. A hundred years later, they went into centralization. So they went into, uh, you know, industrial production. India, we didn't do that. We stayed with the cottage, at least the craft sector. Only in the, in around 1869, like that, they discovered uh, chemical dyes. So then they made the third shift. So the first shift was the language of chemistry. Second shift was industrialization, centralization, outside of the home. The third shift was to chemical uh, material. In India, the first two shifts never happened. It was only the third shift that happened. So we were using the chemical dyes, but we were still using it at home with that soda ash washing and uh, you know bleaching it with the cow dung. So when actually in the 90s we went back and said let's discover it together, all we had to actually do was give them back the modern knowledge, give them back the natural dye, the materials itself, which had been replaced by the chemicals, and the knowledge that had to be built again was how to use the moderns. And that between what was written in the book and what they remembered, we could reconstruct. So, for example, if you want to get a really beautiful red, you have to put the yarn first in karakai, which has tannin. And you have to then put it in alum, soak it in alum. Then you have to dye it in the red. This is the recipe. Now, in the beginning, we didn't know that you had to put it in the alum, in the, in the karakai, because it was not written anywhere. They said, take cured yarn. So we would, we would just take yarn. It didn't work. Then somebody told us, you have to put uh, this uh, karakai first. So when we went and told the weavers, they said it's too much work, we're not doing. So we said, okay, we'll do it here in Hyderabad. We'll do the karakai and we'll send it to you. 
you do the alum and uh, the red in your village. The red was very beautiful because the first time round without the color, the color completely ran away and made fools of all of us. So we were all embarrassed. So we said, oh, the color is very beautiful. So then uh, Odal, the weaver said, uh, I'll also do. So he dipped in karakai, dipped in alum, dipped in red, no color, one pale pink. And he was convinced that we were not telling him, Salim, who was a master dyer, not telling us, keeping secrets. <laughs> so we also didn't know, we thought, is it the water, is it? So then as a joke, I said, you know what, the yarn actually needs a bus ride from Hyderabad to Chinnur, only then it will take color. <laughs> and then the next time the fabric came, we had beautiful red, not just beautiful red, we had beautiful brown. Another completely other color was also very beautiful. So then I asked Odalu, what happened? So he said, to oh, bus ride, you said, no? So he said, what? He said, no, between the Karakai treatment and the alum treatment, you have to let the yarn rest. And that's not something you're going to write in a recipe because it's not active work. So you won't write it. And especially what happens with the karaka is because you have to let it rest for 15 days, it doesn't even enter your recipe. It's just something everybody knows that of course you have to put it in karaka before you put it in color. So you don't write it in the recipe. So it's the kind of knowledge that is collective that everybody knows, like taking off your slippers when you go into a temple. Nobody will tell you, take your slippers off. We just know it because everybody does it. So it was like that. And what he had done with the brown is because he realized it needs curing, he put the brown in, took it out. Now the brown has the tannin in the color, so it's not separate. So he took it out, he left it wet, put it in a dark place, didn't let it dry, covered it with uh, gunny and kept watering it over the night. And so by the morning the tannin had really soaked in and you had this lovely brown. Now this is something that I could not have thought of in my dreams. But it is a natural process for him to, to retain moisture because he understands yarn. So, and he understands how, how materials work. So, yes, he was doing and I was reading, but what we brought together was actually the knowledge of the moderns. And that is what the understanding that doing this kind of reflective research work gave me, so that it helps now, it inverts the hierarchy, at least it gives me peace of mind, it may not change the world. That I am not thinking I knew and he did and that hierarchy is, uh, you know, because that would be the same thing, I mean big deal. Now we are really able to say, I don't have to say, oh he knows, he is a great person because he knows, because he does. I can actually show what exactly he knows, that I don't know. The modern knowledge, I am able to explicate it. So I think for me that has been the big journey. So I'll stop here. Thank you for your patient listening and I'll be happy for questions. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to know if uh, some of all of the things that you have done so far have been done in your So they are, that is the clear answer, but I would like us to take one step back. Now I am going to tell you two stories. One story is that when I first went to the Netherlands, I was extremely shocked by the food. Because for lunch they eat two dry, I don't know if you all have ever been, two dry pieces of bread with one dry piece of cheese. So first time I went for a conference, that was my introduction, I came out at lunch time, they had this bun with one piece of cheese inside on the table. I ate it. Then I said, where is lunch? <laughs> <laughs> and now I tell this story because the Dutch people will say, we don't have culture. Indians have culture. We don't have culture. Now to me this bread and cheese is culture. But they don't see it as culture because what is culture to them? Big elephant, snake, temple, this is culture. Okay? So there is already a kind of idea of something as culture and something as science. 
Of course, the elephant doesn't look like science, I agree. But at the same time, taking care of an elephant might not just be culture. Just, just because you uh, put a bottu on it or something, it doesn't become, you know, on, like the indigo vat. Taking care of the vat, he will pray to it every day. That's not culture. He prays to it, but now there's another uh, story. This is the story that my father told me and I don't know what it says about what he thought about me that he felt he had to tell me the story. But he told me when I was quite young. So there is this newly married couple and the wife wants to please her husband. So, do you know the story already? <laughs> okay. So she asks him what can I do? So he says the grandmother next door, the widow next door, she knows how to make these vadas. So you learn how to make that and you, uh, I'll be very happy. So next day evening he comes home, he's hungry, he's waiting and she comes and she's holding this uh, uh, pot full of um, soaked uh, uh, dal and says, see I made vada. So he says, this is not vada. <laughs> so she says, oh sorry, sorry. So next day she goes back and then that lady says, okay, you soak the minapapu, now you you grind it. She says, okay, okay, okay goes on. Then she gives this fellow again. Then he says, look, this is not working. You go there, you do what she does from beginning to end and get me that vada. The next day when he comes home, he finds actually the widow with her white sari and shaven head is making the vada in his house. So he says, ayo grandmother, why did you come and make it? I didn't mean for that. And she turns around, it's his wife. Because she did everything that lady did from beginning to end, which included shaving her hair. So the question is that, you know, our categories of, so now when he said from beginning to end, he had a clear idea of what constitutes vada making, she, which she didn't have. So how is she to know whether the shaving of the head is to do with the vada making or not? <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we have already made these categories by which we end up in culture, livelihood, lifestyle, space. Of course, it's tied to our lifestyles. Of course, the fact that you need running water and you needed that river, uh, you know, is tied to the way you lived. But that same river is undry now. Does that mean if you use tap water, you're not, it's not culture anymore? So there are these kinds of traps that we should avoid. It doesn't take away the, 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 the difference, but also to see the sameness. Talked about uh, the craft people, they felt bad when it was recast as an innovation. And like this, I mean, they put it as tradition and they don't like the word innovation. So, what could be the reason behind them detesting uh, this word of innovation? See, the language of modernity has not been very um, empowering for them. So, what is it to say innovation? Usually, when people look at handloom, they say, oh, this is traditional, this is this thing. We want modern, we want innovation. So what they are doing is not valued because it is seen as tradition. So what they want is for you to build value for that. They don't want to become this. So that was the anger, that you are not recognizing who I am. You want to make me into something else in order to make me valuable. Then they are clever enough to say, okay, if I call myself that, then maybe I will get something. But then that also has to change to include them. So it has to be a two-way thing. So your understanding of what is innovation has to change to include them. And they have to walk one step and say, okay, we are, we are doing something new, even though we are doing it in an older way. So it's that kind of, I think these polarities uh, have to be negotiated a little bit. I'm not saying that they should always be negotiated, but sometimes it's productive. It can be productive to find in between spaces and words and ways. It gives them confidence to say that we, we can do Navakalpana. But if it doesn't give them confidence, then they shouldn't use it. So that's basically the... So you have to pay attention. It's not the word itself. You can't impose a category on them that they are not comfortable with. 
and once they are comfortable they will take it where they want it but it should you should be in a position where you can negotiate it actually that's that's more what i'm saying The thing is that this is precisely the thing. If you don't think of it as knowledge, if you think of it as work, and then the, all those steps become, you know, it's something that children, you know, child labor. Then people who don't go to school, illiterate, they end up on the loom. So th see, the fact that we don't value it as knowledge then creates that thing where then why isn't a PhD an apprenticeship? PhD is equally an apprenticeship. You go to a big musician and learn, it's equally an apprenticeship. There's nothing wrong with apprenticeship. In fact, as you go into higher, uh, uh, more focused learning, apprenticeship is the only way that you are able to learn. It's a recognized thing. So apprenticeship in itself is not the problem or learning at home is not the problem. The problem is that it's not recognized as pedagogy. It is seen as work. So, and we have no way of evaluating. We don't know who is a good weaver, the weaver, lo. we don't know who is the good weaver, who is the bad weaver, all weavers are the same. Imagine if you said all doctors are the same, the fellow who passed out just now and the fellow, and forget fellow who passed out, fellow who sat at the loom for 10 minutes also can call himself a weaver today. No, you do some hobby weaving and you are also a weaver. So you have no mode, so all the things that come when you have an institutionalization and a which I don't mean mainstream science institution, musicians have their own ways of evaluating. Audiences are discerning. And then they have these institutions of a certificate, like for example, something simple like AIR. They grade all the musicians. Sometimes musicians go and get themselves graded just to get the grade, not because they want to sing in the, they will say I'm a AIR, uh, A grade or you know, a musician. So that's a way of evaluating that they have been able to do that uh, but then that's taken them into different problems that we hear of now. But, uh, uh, you know, in that sense, I think to be aware, not to fall into a trap where you become too exclusive, community-based, uh, that the learning is kept closely policed because you don't want to dilute it. And between getting into this kind of, uh, the, like what has happened to Ayurveda, where it's completely become, uh, you know, uh, the way of knowing Ayurveda has just completely been lost. So between those ways, there is something for craft to learn as it uh, proceeds along this path of um, validating itself. Any, anybody doing any research on craft and handloom? Any kind of hand? La, no? Everything is craft, no? Now according to me. So, okay. What are you doing your research on? <laughs> Research students? Master. master. Yeah, master. Yeah, in fact, I, I'm just coming from Yalahanka where there is an old uh, handloom uh, cluster. See, I didn't, in the middle of Bangalore, there is an four streets. Some handlooms are there, some powerlooms are there. And uh, what, that's the thing, it's an ecology. Handloom, powerloom, mills, khadi. All those four modes of production are an ecology. You cannot, actually they're so intertwined today. Some technologies like, uh, for example, yarn production will serve three out of four. Only khadi it doesn't serve. Uh, cotton growing serves all. So there are uh, something like sizing or warping only serves uh, handloom. So there are these uh, different technologies, but it's all part of one ecology. So when you, when you're thinking analytically, you have to think in terms of, you know, it can't be a simple mechanization versus 
making by hand argument. I think that would be a little simplistic. The question is, what does making by hand give you at that point? And recently we were talking about uh, what is craft and uh, I think what we all agreed on is anything that is that takes time, that you do taking time is craft. Any attempt is true, but you have a discussion either in the Shastra or not. In the past, the Chilpa Shastra is a text you will find. Sculptors are not always upper caste. In weaving? In in the past, I'm wondering if there have been attempts to modify practice. That's either a... in folk form or in... I really like that question. And I have a long answer. <laughs> because that's what I'm thinking about now in my new project. So I try to get to that question in different ways. Now, what do we mean when we talk about Shastra? It's a kind of a codification, right? Or a textualizing. So one direction I went was to see what kind of texts do weavers produce? Because there is no written account of weaving. That just doesn't, it, even in this uh, 12th century, I forget the name, this is a big tome on uh, everyday knowledge, which has cooking in it. It, te it tells you about how to wear clothes, but doesn't tell you how to make. Somehow, weaving has completely been um, left out of this whole writing business. So then I thought, okay, let's go at it the other way. What do weavers write? And then you find that they write poetry. And if you look at all the 12th century poets, they're all craftspeople. And you read that poetry, it's all in Kannada, you re, uh, that, that's my f uh, language of study. I grew up in Udupi. They're all making claims of the body, of knowing through the body. Of course, the knowing that they know is of God. They're not saying, I know science. But then, at that time, Shastra was all about uh, knowing God in any case. So they, when they say, Dehave Degula, for example, they are not just saying, they are not making a spiritual claim, they are making an epistemic claim. So there is something about claiming that this is a way of knowing. So that is one kind of body of work I think we should look at. If we, and it is something that I would very much like to do. To actually look at and it is it's, um, uh, it's across all those poets. They are all talking about the bodily needs and uh, you know, uh, Akama Devi, you know, the, the the experience, Anubhava, so, so it's a very clear category that we should look at when we talk about knowledge. The other uh, thing is something that in my new project where the person I'm working with is a senior scholar who's looking at ancient, weaving in ancient Greece and uh, also mathematics. So she's a historian of mathematics and of ancient Greece. And what she is saying is that the, the entire uh, debates, the, the debates that went into, for example, Plato, Aristotle, all of them talk about pure knowledge, which is disembedded from material, which is very Brahminical. So clearly, as an urge, it's, it's very long-standing. And separation from women. The woman is every day, she is impure. You have to be, you know... <coughs> So numbers are pure. So abstraction is pure. So, so her question is, and that led to the kind of science they have today. But if you combine it then with what she is saying, and when you, when you start looking at uh, actually what happens when people weave. Now, because I am studying algorithms and weaving together, I was talking to this person who makes algorithmic music, this algo rave. Now they, in, they, they create cycles, so they have sound bites and they program it to create music. So they keep intervening and changing the code, then that changes the music. Basically what they are trying to say with that is that even if you have something that is causal, that is if you do A you will come up with B. It, when you have complex layering of interventions, it's not predictable. Just because it's causal doesn't mean it's predictable. 
So what they were saying is the number of possibilities when you sit on the loom and you have to pick a thread and you have one thread every repeat is say 42 inches you have 72 into 42 number of threads and if you take a square of that size 72 into 42 into 17 into 42. So every time you raise a thread it's one of that many chances to make a pattern. Now already that has gone beyond anything even a computer can compute. It will take a th computer three days to compute that all the possibilities and then how are you going to choose so weavers had a way of making those decisions materially so it, it's a knowledge that you learned of pattern making through that allowed you to that created conditions within those conditions of possibility you made certain choices and that's very very complex decision making that you make in an embodied sense it's not something you can do only cerebrally so her contention is that actually notation comes in the way of that kind of decision making. So the reason why weavers never felt the need to notate is because the conceptual frames were being operated on, on the loom. The algorithms were what they were creating on the loom. So they didn't need to read it, write it down. And the idea that you write an algorithm and you program a computer and that's complex is just underrating what the weaver is doing and simplifying the world which is why we are ending up now with this new algorithmic world into very very simple kind of yes no decisions the nuance that is possible to us is not possible there so her contention actually is that notation and it also for me explains why it's possible that in India we didn't actually trust notation to be an authoritative mode of knowledge maybe that's why we ended up with keeping our material knowledge was described it once uh, as that the cloth itself tells the story. So because of creating it and then passing it on to somebody and that itself is a way of transmitting this knowledge and story. Yes, and and it's mul yeah, and it's multiple knowledges. It's a record. It's a visual record. So it kind of collapses time. All the decisions that you have made are there. But what is interesting is it's also a record of all the decisions that you could have made that you didn't make all the po possible patterns that for the weaver for the person who's seeing the pattern they see the pattern so it's it really becomes uh, a computer in that sense Yeah, yeah. It was very much a knowledge in use in practice, and they didn't think it could be conserved in any other way. That's quite possible. Yeah, and it's happening in practice. It's and it's you know so. Uh, uh, where is the youth needed in this field who want to work with the artisans? Where are? Where is the youth <coughs> needed in this field? Youth uh, as in we. Where are you needed? Uh -huh. Okay. I'll put it the other way around. I'll say that wherever you are, you can work with the artisan. You don't have to go looking. If you are uh, at a very meta level, if you are a person who values willing to learn and values what is made using craft then you will see craft everywhere then you won't buy for example a plastic packet or you won't be satisfied with a t-shirt you will want something that's crafted you will want something no so you first of all you you can just be a consumer you can just be someone who appreciates from wherever you are but I think the old idea of fixing the problem of handloom is um, not as productive as really spending time and figuring out where is your aptitude to be a craftsperson. So, for example, if I, you know, you might have a material affiliation, you might like mud, clay better than you like thread. 
you might find yourself attracted to gold <laughs> to jewelry making or you might find that you like knitting there is a certain material effect so i would go with following those kinds of things because um, i think those are the things that get left out when you try and make a economic intervention or a, a institutional intervention and then what is going to sustain you and what is going to build a relationship for you with the weaver say you are you doing research what do you do i am a mtech student uh, so i am interested in the sector but let's see okay so there are multiple kinds of people working there are people who are doing marketing there are people who are doing design there are people who are mobilizing there are people who are like we are now planning in uh, august 15th to 21st we want to bring indigo dyers together from 25 different techniques and locations along with scholars but not to study indigo dyers but to get them to define what does it mean to know indigo for themselves so how do you make such a event how can you even get a historian of technology who knows indigo dyeing in france in the 16th century but knows exactly um, what went right and what went wrong and might actually have something to offer to the person who is struggling now with standardization how do you get them to talk to each other so we are going to have a meeting and uh, what we have so to tell you so we said okay as a pr preparation documentation writing is not going to work so we said okay let's do visual documentation then we got into this uh, widow problem so this people went and recorded then they came back and showed the recording of one dyer to another dyer that fellow was saying beautiful things we were like oh he said the vat is like my lover and i have to take care of her every day and we were mighty impressed with him and he, and, and you know he, he really meant it and the indigo dyer my god you are recording all this they'll beat me <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this uh, um the indigo salim he said i don't trust him he talks too much <laughs> and like, what this is for you we are making these videos so that you you know you you have some understanding of each other's process we thinking of our, you know i don't know then uh, then what to do then then the video makers were very disheartened so they said but what would you like to see then so he thought he scratched his head then he said see the problem is that when he is talking and he is dipping the yarn the yarn, the color is turning green and at that stage of dyeing it should be blue it should not be green so clearly he is doing something wrong so i don't so he is not even listening to what that fellow is saying he is just saying i don't want to hear him talk but he is looking for something in the in the process so then this to and fro went on so what do you want to see he said they show the whole thing no from beginning to end <laughs> they said that's what we did So no 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 this so then uh, professor shivishnathan was in the room and he started laughing so i said tell us something save us <laughs> so then he came up with this very nice thing he said salim is looking for a procedural authenticity in the film which will tell him that the film is true that will convince him that it's a proper representation of the process just going and taking a video is not going to be a representation of the process for him so once he said that we dispersed then all of us including the filmmakers who are all going to organize the indigo program we spent 8 days in the indigo dye house learning how to dye because if we can't tell between the green stage and the blue stage there's no point in telling anybody else so 8 days sat with blue and this is how i know freshly people smelling their hands i have of course learned it before so i was not so enamored by the smell but you know the other 7 8 people wore their shorts and their t-shirts and this thing and these uh, dyers young women they taught them morning to evening made them work they were exhausted but now they feel ready to do that conference now they feel ready to facilitate that conversation so Thank you.
I think that if we want it, it will live. If we don't value it, it will go. Government? No. 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 I have worked 30 years, one generation of my institution has supported one generation of weavers. There is no doubt that the government plays a role. Everybody has to play their role. That is the whole socio-technical system. Everybody has to work. It's only when the positive forces work together that the ensemble becomes sustainable. If the negative forces get together, so it's not any single actor. That's the good thing. So if a cooperative works with an NGO, works with a customer who is willing to pay 5 rupees more, works with a weaver who is confident, it's a sustainable system. If a, a master weaver works with a labor, uh, you know, low skill, you know, uh, oppressed uh, weaver who is working from 8 in the morning to 12 and will drop dead any moment with a state that says uh, modernization and industry that is saying mechanization, that weaver will die. So, it is about these, I think, keep, keeping a systemic view is, will keep you sane, otherwise that question will take your sleep. <laughs> See, that is, that's what I started with, that we are single-handedly responsible for, and I will say it as scholars, for not being able to create a world where there is a uh, future for a handloom weaver. We have not even imagined such a world. We only imagine them as a traditional creature who is stuck in a museum. Why will they want to be? So, I, I think that if you, it, it's like, you know, beating a child and saying, oh, that child doesn't want to come to me. So stop beating the child, the child will come. <laughs> so it's like that. I think if we value, in places where there is value, we must do well. And places, and it, the value is not only in the market. If you keep on saying uh, they are uh, traditional, they are this thing, they sit in the pit, and the only time you want to see them is when they are crying and in despair, that image of themselves is not something, I mean, I would not want to... Uh, so I think that question is, uh, is, I mean it's putting more agency on the weaver and I think the agency for that question is more with us. Because it's actually for me a surprise given 200 years of state sponsored uh, industrialization, how we have so much weaving. That is the bigger question. How is it that we still have weaving? We have such differentiated, fantastic, high skilled people spend 30, 40 years acquiring skills. Why? So, we were talking about standardization. So, what did standardization do in terms of designs and uh, even the NGOs may be dictating designs on the people. So, what has done to their innovation now? Basically, it killed it. But, the thing is that if you think that standardized, I, I am an engineer, I believe in standard. Now say you have a five and a half meter sari or say you have a blouse, one, and one meter blouse. If you don't standardize the weave, after you wash it, it will shrink. You can't wear it again. So standardization has always been something that craft did. The question is whether you see where the standardization is, how they standardize. And for this I will give an example that uh, again, I only learned through, because of my research. We would go and tell the dyer, make this color. 
So what is this color? We will show you a nice blue, deep blue. What is this color? Damayanti. Make Damayanti. Next time, brown. No, 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 not this. Damayanti. Yeah, Damayanti. No, 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 make, then we show him. No, no, this Damayanti. Oh, this Damayanti. Okay, fine. Next time, purple. Then you say, see, these fellows are idiots, they don't know how to standardize. So from now on, we let's treat them like idiots. We will put a number and we will put a sample and send it to them and say, you match it. He doesn't care. He says, okay, fine. Matches it. 20 years I worked like this. Then I went back to that same village. And I said, what is this Damayanti? And I found out it is depth of color. <laughs> because for the dyer, it doesn't matter which powder he uses. That is not his skill. How deep he makes the color, that is the skill. So if you show him different colors, he is not even registering. Because the process of making it all, is all the same. Only thing that he varies, that is in his hand, is depth. So he was giving me deep blue, deep brown, deep purple. <laughs> I didn't see it. <laughs> I have many such stories. <laughs> Thank you.